Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. It's so good uh, to be back here. It's been uh, a couple of years, I think, since I've, I've preached here. In the early years of the village, uh, I used to uh, preach over at Highland Village uh, a bunch and uh, got to know this church really became kind of a home away from home for me. And uh, since I've been at Providence, I've come back here a couple of times uh, to preach. A lot of uh, great things happening uh, in, our, uh, war, in our life at Providence. We've uh, uh, we're in Frisco, Texas, and uh, we've planted three churches in the area, which has been awesome to see. And um, we've sent out uh, tons of missionaries, and just it's been a blessing. I've got three kids uh, now, and I just baptized my oldest daughter uh, last week. So it's been a, it's been a really fun season. So. Anyways, it's good to be back. I love this place. I love your uh, pastors are some of my best friends. In fact, I'm going hiking with some of them this summer, praying that I make it back alive from that. So anyways, grab your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to preach a sermon that, you know, we just finished walking through 2 Corinthians at my church, and so it's kind of hard to just pop in the middle of a book um, and as a standalone, but this is one of my favorite passages because it really speaks a lot to what our um, identity is as Christians, and that's what I want to speak to you about uh, this morning. Just a, a quick little background. Paul started this church in Corinth, uh, learns about essentially uh, some dissension in the church, uh, toleration of gross sin. Um, you know, some are saying, man, I belong to Apollos. I belong to Paul. Some are Jesus juking saying, well, I don't need to, I belong to Jesus. You know, there's just a lot of boasting happening. And so essentially, uh, just to fast forward, he writes them this real, what he calls a tearful letter, uh, calling them out. Many of the people receive this letter and they, and they, um, they repent. And he's writing 2 Corinthians on the heels of that, rejoicing that the letter he wrote moved them to grief, but it was a godly grief that led them to repent. And so uh, some, though, are still being uh, swayed by what he calls these super apostles. So after Paul left Corinth, some, uh, apparently some other leaders came into Corinth, and, and these guys are boasting in their own power, in their own strength, in their own effort, their gifts, and they're saying, look at Paul, man, he's, he's weak, he writes boldly, but in presence, he's kind of weak, uh, he, he, he suffers, he's not very eloquent, and so they've casted doubt on his apostleship and his authority over the Corinthians, and so Paul is writing this letter, uh, again, rejoicing in those who have repented, but also he's worried that some of this corrosive thinking uh, has penetrated uh, his, his children in the faith. And he wants to show them that, first of all, boasting in your own strength shows a total lack of awareness of reality. You know, I heard once that Muhammad Ali was flying on a plane he didn't have his, uh, his seatbelt buckled, and a flight attendant said, hey, sir, would you buckle your seatbelt? And he's like, Superman don't need a seatbelt. And uh, she goes, Superman don't need a plane. Buckle up, right? <laughs> so, I mean, just a complete lack of awareness. And that's what he writes. He goes, do you not know, first of all, they're boasting, but you yourselves, he says, are a commendation, a letter of recommendation. And in other words, the fact that you exist as a church is proof that God is working through me in my weakness because he's their father in the faith. And then he says, man, to boast in your own strength doesn't make sense because everything you have has been given to you by God. And so he says, man, and he says in 2 Corinthians 10, he says, man, these super apostles, they compare themselves with each other. They have the wrong measuring stick. He says, God has assigned you a specific area of influence, he writes in Corinthians. And he says, really, the measuring stick is faithfulness to what God has assigned you to. Uh, 
And so what I want us to look at is what has God really assigned us to? What has he really called us to? And that's what he's going to talk about in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. He's going to show how Paul viewed himself, his life, his ministry, his purpose. And it's going to speak a lot to our identity and our calling. So look at it with me, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death and to other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. All right, so let me just hit three ways that Paul views his life that I think we ought to view our life this way. Number one, he views his life as being a captive of Christ. So here in the text that we just read, he says, thanks be to God who in Christ leads us in a triumphal procession. What's that about? Every one of the Corinthians would have immediately known what Paul is referring to. So in the, Roman, in the days of the Roman Empire, when the conquering Roman general would, would come back from war, he would lead uh, all of his soldiers, then behind them, all of his prisoners of war. He would lead them through the streets of the city. People would jeer at them, mock them, spit on them, shame them until they get, make their way to the city square where they were executed. And what Paul is saying here, and by the way, the original language, when he says God is leading us in a triumphal procession, the original language means that we are being triumphed over. So Paul doesn't see himself as the Roman general, you know, triumphant, or as one of his soldiers triumphant. No, no, no. Paul says, I'm one of the captives of war. The only other place that that triumphed over is used, by the way, in the New Testament, that word is in Colossians 2.15. When Paul speaks of Jesus nailing our debt to the cross, he says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In other words, the enemy of God, Satan and his demons have been triumphed over and now Paul is using that same word to refer to himself. That's how you ought to view yourself. If you're a Christian, he's saying, you're boasting, but really honestly, we're captives. We are being led in a processional, being mocked by the world, ultimately leading to our death. Now, why in the world is Paul rejoicing in this? Well, first of all, the fact that he's rejoicing shows that the way he views this triumph, being triumphed over, is much different than Satan. Satan doesn't rejoice over being triumphed by Christ, triumphed over by Christ. Paul is saying, thanks be to God that he has triumphed over me because Paul understands now on this side of his salvation that he was actually an enemy of God. Do you know his story that he was persecuting the church? He was on his way to Damascus hunting down Christians. He was a terrorist, if you will. And Jesus arrested him with a blinding light and he said to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he ultimately said, you are going to carry my name before the Gentiles and the rulers of the world. And so Paul went from being an enemy of Christ to becoming a, a, an ambassador for Christ, spreading the gospel everywhere. And so he says, thanks be to God that he triumphed over my will. Do you thank God that he triumphed over you? That man, you were an enemy of God. Do you know that? We weren't innocent bystanders. The scripture says we were enemies of Christ, walking in rebellion until God arrested us. And so he rejoices because he says, it's in Christ that I'm being led. In other words, he has in view that this is the same call that Christ had. Christ was called Philippians 2 says, though he was equal with God, he didn't consider that something to be held on to, but he emptied himself and came as a bondservant and became obedient to God all the way to the point of the death of the cross. Picture Jesus carrying his cross in a triumphal procession, being taken captive by the will of the Father, 
walking through the streets of Jerusalem, being jeered at until he reaches Calvary. And Paul is saying, I rejoice in that because in Christ, I am walking the same path that he walked. Did you know, Matthew 16, Jesus told his disciples, I'm gonna go suffer, die, and rise again. And he turns to them and he says in Matthew 16, 24, if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Take up your cross. You gotta die to your will, to your dreams, to your desires, and you do so because of joy, because you want to serve God. That is the true call of Christ. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, he tells the Thessalonians, I know that you receive the, the, the gospel not just in word, but in the power of the Holy Spirit because you turn from idols to serve the living God. You were triumphed over and you gave your life to following Jesus in his path. Some of you know my story. I was raised in a Muslim home. My dad was a Muslim taught me the ways of Islam, and when I became a Christian, I hid my faith from him until he found out, and he made me choose between him and Jesus. And by God's strength alone, because everything in me wanted to say, forget it, I'll be a Muslim, I didn't want to lose my dad. By God's strength alone, I was able to say, if I have to choose between you and Jesus, then I choose Jesus. My dad disowned me, and I'm telling you, it was because of the joy of following Christ that I was able to supernaturally, by God's grace, Walk that path. And so it proves, friends, that you belong to Jesus. Listen, in, in John 15, Jesus says this. Listen, he says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. He says, if you belong to the world, the world wouldn't hate you. But the world hates you because I called you out of the world. So catch what he's doing here. The super apostles are boasting and in, in being, you know, they're so mighty and and triumphant in the eyes of the world. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. What uniquely distinguishes me as an apostle is the fact that the world rejects me. What, listen to me, Christian. What uniquely distinguishes you as a follower of Christ is not that the world applauds you, is that the world actually scoffs and rejects you. This is why the early church, when they were beaten for speaking the name of Jesus, they actually stopped and they thanked God because they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. Peter writes in 1 Peter, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God rests on you. It proves you belong to him. So in 1 Corinthians 4, he writes to them and he says, you guys are reigning like kings. You're rich, you're wise. We're becoming fools. We're being beaten. We are, as he says, the scum of the earth. That's who we are. And so in other words, he's saying, man, you have forgotten your identity. You're not to be applauded by the world. And friend, here's the cool thing. The reason I think ultimately throughout the scope of Corinthians, he says that I rejoice in being taken captive. They are boasting in their strength and they say he is weak and he's flipping the script on them and saying, you do not even understand the Christian life because the paradox of the Christian life is true power lies in weakness. This is all, the Christian life is one big giant paradox that life comes through death. That wisdom comes through foolishness. That strength and power comes through weakness. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul speaks of a thorn that he was given in the flesh. And he said that he pleaded three times with the Lord that it would be taken away from him. And God said to him, no, essentially. He says, my grace will be sufficient for you. Listen to what he says. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And so you know what Paul says? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses. Because when I am weak, I am strong. See what he's doing here? He's saying, no, no, no. They're boasting in their strength and they've forgotten. The call of Christ is for you to be taken captive. And man, it's actually in your weakness where Christ's power shines the most. His power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, 
is made perfect in weakness. Why? Because in weakness, we surrender our own efforts and we rely on God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 8, he says, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia, for we were utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us, catch this, rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again on him we have set our hope. Friend, it's like if you've ever water skied, you know what I'm talking about. You, if you try to pull yourself up out of the water in your own strength, it's not gonna work. What you do is you surrender you sit back in the water and you allow the power of the boat to pull you out and then you stand up with it. This is the same thing, friend. It, he says, no, 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 strength doesn't come from our effort. It actually comes from in our weakness surrendering to God's power. If John 15 is true, where Jesus says, if you abide in me, you're gonna bear much fruit and apart from me, you can do nothing, then friend, the thorn in the side may not actually be something to be despised, but something to be thankful for if it causes you to abide in Christ. Paul in Philippians, <laughs> he says, man, my chains in Philippians 1, because see, the Philippians, he, he's writing to them. They were supporting his missionary effort, and they find out that he's in prison. And he wants to make sure that they don't think, well, we shouldn't support him. He's in prison. That money's going to be wasted. The gospel's hindered because he's in prison. You know what he says? On the contrary, because I'm in prison, the gospel is spreading. My chains are showing that, that uh, it's being shown that my chains are for Christ. And he speaks of the imperial guard. And let me tell you who that, that was uh, in those times in, in the Roman Empire. The imperial guard of the Praetorian was 9,000 of the most chosen elite men in Roman society. And their job was whenever there was a notorious prisoner to one by one be, uh, be um, uh, chained to that prisoner. So let's look at God's plan. You want to spread the gospel throughout Rome? How about you take 9,000 of the most elite men and you chain them one by one to Paul? You see it? Paul says, you think that this thorn is hindering the gospel. No. His power is made perfect in my weakness. It's flipped. The gospel spreads even more. You see, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited, a proud, arrogant Paul would have hindered the gospel's advance. But a broken, humiliated, captive Paul would have been dependent on God's power and the gospel spread even more. Friend, when you understand this truth, that thorn in your flesh, look at me, that you're saying, why God? And you might be saying, Man, if it wasn't for that in my life, where would I be right now? Thinking it would be better. You might start saying this. If it wasn't for that thorn in my side, where would I be now? Knowing it would be worse. Thank you, God, for the thorn to keep me relying on you. And so, friend, we're captives of Christ. Secondly, we are the aroma of Christ. Verse 15, we're the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing from death to death and from life to life. And let me explain this. The Corinthians who read this would have again immediately known what Paul is referring to. That triumphal procession that I was referring to, Roman general, army, the captives of war behind them, being led through the city and jeered and mocked. At the very front of that processional, there would be uh, one with a censer, and inside would be this incense that they would literally kind of waft it back and forth, and that aroma would be spreading throughout the street. To the king and to the Roman general, it would be an aroma of triumph. But to those prisoners... That aroma would be the smell of death. 
that was coming for them. And you know what Paul is saying? He's just flipping this whole thing. And he's saying, we are actually that aroma. And I want you to see that the aroma goes in three directions. First, he says, the aroma of Christ to God. And the picture that he has in mind, I think he fleshes it out for Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6. Listen to what he writes there. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. So let me explain what, what, what's going on there. What Paul is referencing to Timothy, Timothy would understand. In the Old Testament days, in, in, in the, the Jewish worship rituals, what they would do when they would make that animal sacrifice, they would put it on a searing hot altar, and then what they would do is they'd get this expensive wine, and they'd pour it out on that animal sacrifice, and the wine would evaporate away, and it was meant to be pleasing aroma to God. And if anyone looked at the altar, they would no longer see the wine. They would only see the sacrifice. And here's what Paul is saying. That is my life. My life is I am a drink offering being poured out. And I, my prayer is that when people look at me, they don't see Paul. They just see Jesus. They see the sacrifice. So what am I? My life is just this mist, this aroma, that my prayers would be pleasing to God. And look at me, Christian, do you know when you take up your cross and you walk away from money, from fame, all right, from your dreams, from your dad, from a relationship, whatever it may be to follow Christ, do you know that God looks down and he leans in and he smells the aroma of your life and it's pleasing to him? He says, that's my child who I called. Do you want to live to be an aroma to God? Paul says, if I live to please men in Galatians 1, then I'm no longer a disciple of Christ. I don't belong to Jesus. And so we're an aroma to God, first of all. But then secondly, we are an aroma to others. And friend, take note that the entire world is divided into two camps. I mean, we have all these camps that we want to talk about, right? Race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, political party. We, you know, everyone kind of wants to divide everybody into... Th let me tell you, the way God looks down at humanity, he sees two camps. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And here's the crazy thing. He says your life is going to be an aroma that is going to clarify those two camps. He says, for some, you're going to be the aroma of death. In other words, they're going to look at your life, Christian, and they're going to see, they're going to smell death. They're going to pity you. They're going to despise you. They're going to look at you and say, what a waste. They, all they see is death. You've just given up your life. What a fool you are. And that kind of thinking this is what he's saying, fragrance of death to death. That kind of thinking, smelling death when they look at your life, if they stay in that kind of thinking, it's going to actually lead to their death, their destruction. And that's, what he's, that's the sad part. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. In other words, they're going to malign you, but sadly, it's going to lead to their judgment. My mom, when I first became a Christian, my parents were divorced um, at, when I was two. So she found out about my dad disowning me and all this stuff. What's going on? So she called me and I said, well, mom, uh, I'm a Christian. My, dad, my mom at that time, she's a believer now, but at that time, she was a nominal uh, Muslim. And she was like, oh, what? And I go, well, I'm a Christian. I'm following Jesus. So dad disowned me. And she just said, Afshin, just, okay, fine, be a Christian, but everything in moderation. <laughs> and I remember getting off the phone and getting on my knees and saying, Lord, whatever you do, spare me from a moderate Christian life. Okay? Because this is, the, the world's going to look and say, ridiculous, pitiful. But to some, you're going to be a fragrance of life leading to life. Life. 
They're going to smell your life, if you will. And they're going to wonder, what do you have that I need? Why are you living with, with such joy in the midst of all this crud we're going through? How are you able to live totally different, not running after what everybody else runs after? How are you content? How are you full of joy? And they're going to ask you a reason for the hope that is within you. And you're going to be able to open your mouth once they've been able to smell your life and tell them about Jesus. And what they're going to hear is going to be the fragrance of life, if you will. They're going to smell that, and it's going to lead them to faith, which is going to lead them to life. My brother, let me tell you, I went through a dark period of time where I had panic attacks. And I used to never talk about this dark period of time. Uh, the only way I made it through was clinging to, to, to the scriptures, to God. My brother, two years later, calls me out of the blue. He's like, man, I've had panic attacks. He has an autistic child, a job that was crumbling, had a lot of stress. And he goes, I remember you used to have panic attacks and you somehow got through it. How did you get through it? And I said, bro, Jesus. And he goes, oh, whatever. And I said, no, listen to me. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burden, and I'll give rest for your soul. Scripture says, if you, uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, make a request known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And my brother goes, dude, I need Jesus. He goes, what do I need to do? I said, if you believe in Jesus, he goes, Jesus, I believe in you. Right there on the phone. And I'm like, and God took the darkest time in my life and he redeemed it. You're going to be the fragrance of life to life. I think of John 11 when Jesus learns about Lazarus' sickness. Remember what he says? He says that this sickness will not lead, end in death, but end in the glory of God. And it says, because he loved Lazarus, he stayed back. And you would think, wait a minute, if he loves Lazarus, he would run and take away his sickness. But no, he allows him to die. And he, when he arrives, Lazarus has been four days in the tomb. And he says, roll away the stone. And Martha comes over and says, what are you talking about? He's been in there for four days. There's going to be a stench, an odor, an aroma of death. And he says... Did I not tell you, if you believe in me, you will see the glory of God? And listen to me. He understood. Yes, for him it was death. For some it would be the aroma of death. But when he called Lazarus out and they, he told him to unbind his grave clothes, guess what? You read on and it said, many followed Jesus on account of Lazarus. Because Lazarus was led in a triumphal procession literally to his death, the power of God was made perfect in that weakness, death. And the aroma of Christ spread. Some smelled it as death, many believed. You see, friend, we are sometimes so afraid of smelling like death. I almost call this sermon being a stinky Christian, okay, or something like that. I don't know. We're so afraid of stinking to the world. That we want to put on, if you will, the deodorant of syncretiz syncretization or, or assimilation. We want to kind of smell like the world. We're so afraid. But as we do that, sadly, what happens is we fail to become the aroma of life to those who are going to believe. Throw away the deodorant. You're going to smell, okay? Okay. Some are going to smell death. Some are going to smell light. By the way, everyone smells something. No one has, you know, spiritual COVID. Did you lose your scent of smell in COVID? I don't know if you did or not, but no one has that. Everyone's going to smell something. In this culture that's rising up against the church, I love how Tim Keller in a recent book said there's three wrong approaches. One is to hunker down and batten down the hatches and escape the culture. The other is to, you know, assimilate with the culture. And the other is to, you know, take up the arms and try to attack the culture. And he's like, no, no, no. You follow Jesus as a captive and your life will spread an aroma. Third thing and final thing, you, you are an ambassador for Christ. He says, who is sufficient for these things? He's blown away that my life, 
would be a vessel that actually leads people to their life or ushers them towards their death. He's saying, I can't, this is too much for me. Who is sufficient for these things? I remember being at UT. I was pre-med. I was trying to be a doctor like my dad and make him proud of me. But God called me into the ministry and I knew it and I was wrestling with it and I was studying with two of my friends. One would end up being a doctor. The other end up being a vet. And the future vet said, I remember he said, man, I don't want to be a doctor because I can't imagine the, just the awesome responsibility of having a human life in my hands. And the doctor says, see, to me, I feel this like weight of like, wow, what a responsibility and I, 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 that I have a human life in my hand. And I go, but what about the ministers? Now, stay with me. We don't have human souls in our hand. It's in God's hands. But I just was like, what about the awesome responsibility of a human soul? And they both looked at me and go, whoa, your calling is really deep. <laughs> and that's not boasting, because he says, who is sufficient for these things? In fact, he says in Corinthians, our sufficiency comes from Christ. But friend, if you're a follower of Christ, that's what you are, an ambassador. God is going to actually use you to make his gospel known. Are you blown away that he would choose to do so? He says, we're not peddlers of God. In other words, if God's word, excuse me, well, we're not going to tamper with it. We're going to we're going to preach it. He says, in sincerity, we're going to preach it. In other words, we're not going to just preach one thing and do something else. We're going to really believe it and live it out. He says, we've been commissioned by God. Do you know that where you work, where you play, all right, where, uh, where, uh, where your family is, your neighborhood, all of that is not by accident, but by God's design. And he says, in the sight of God. Do you catch that? In other words, he understands I've been entrusted with this gospel and I'm going to be held accountable to, to God. You see this? He's saying, I don't want to, to, to shirk that responsibility. In Iran, some of the people who've come out of Iran to a neighboring country to be trained, I've been able to go and be a part of their training. And some of them come to this neighboring country hoping, well, maybe this is one step to me getting a visa and getting to America. You can't blame them. Everyone, the world wants to come here. And let me tell you when we know some of them have really got the gospel. And I've heard this. Some of them have gotten their visas and they say, I can't go to America and get comfortable. And they go, I can't know what I know and not go back to Iran, even if it means suffering. Friend, wake up call. Thanks be to God that I am a captive of Christ, that he has triumphed over my will. Jesus says, if you want to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it, and some of you are losing your life. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. He's triumphed over me. I'm an aroma of Christ. My job isn't to try to smell good to the world. My job is to just to be that aroma, be faithful to the calling. And then, man, my job is to steward the gospel as an ambassador. Would you bow your head with me and let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you that the greatest example of this losing your life, of this surrendering to the will of God, the greatest example of life coming through death is you, Jesus that you laid your life down on the cross for us as a fragrant aroma pleasing to the Father. And I pray if there's anyone here who does not know you truly, that you would cause them to smell, if you will, the fragrance of life in the gospel. Jesus is calling you, friend, to be taken captive, to surrender your life to turn and enjoy, embrace him as your king and lose your life that you may find it. And I pray that you would turn and find true life in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.